I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Titus. I thought that uh, Brother John this morning had stolen my message. You don't very often get two messages in the same uh, day on the on the same little book. I was afraid it was going to be on the same verses, but it wasn't. Let's get a stand and we'll read Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. I want to speak on our blessed hope tonight. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Our Father in heaven, once again, we thank we thank thee that we have before us the living word of the living God. And I pray that thou make it alive in each one of our hearts this morning or this evening. Father, we know that Jesus is going to come soon. This world is in a terrible state. I just pray that thou help us to be prepared for that day when he does come, looking forward to his glorious appearing. I pray that you'll bless the message tonight. Fill me with thy spirit. I can't do anything without thee. Without thee, we're absolutely helpless. We can't do anything. Jesus said that in John chapter 15 and verse 5. We ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Please be seated then. <clears throat> we are living in tumultuous, tumultuous times. I didn't know if I could say that word right or not, but we are living in very troublesome times. Oh, the world's been topsy-turvy for centuries, all due to the sin and the problem, uh, the, the sin problem of mankind and of the rejection of God. But I don't think the worldwide security has been really threatened in any age like it is today. We're approaching that time when men's hearts are failing them for fear. We read that in Luke chapter 21 and verse 26. I'll start with verse 25, it says there, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth stress of nations, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Those days are not quite upon us yet. This is describing the state of men's hearts during the tribulation period. And we know that because the very next verse says, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud of in, in a cloud with power and great glory. So we're not there yet. Not there yet. But surely we can see the day approaching. And we need to be watching. In verse uh, 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. When Jesus comes in a cloud, as mentioned in verse 27, that's not pertaining to the rapture of the church, but it is coming in revelation with his saints to bring judgment and establish his kingdom here on the earth. If verse 25 if verse 25 describes the condition of the nations during that terrible time of trouble, how much worse it will be then than it is now. Pastor Rockwood used to say that that word perplexity means <clears throat> that our rulers can see no way out. They can see no way out. And it seems like that is the way that it is today. But our hope is not in our governments. It's not there, not in any solution or device that man may provide, but our hope is in the coming of the Lord. The world does not have that hope. 
If you're unsaved here this evening, you don't have that hope. You can have, you can have it before you leave this evening, but if you've never come to Jesus for forgiveness and for cleansing from sin, and have never asked him to be your personal Lord and Savior, this hope is not for you. It's not for you. Salvation is always a personal matter. Salvation is a transaction between the sinner that's destined to go to a place called hell and torment. It's a transaction between the sinner and God. It's always, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, John chapter 1 and verse 12. God's free gift of salvation is for you, Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, to all men. Some erroneously try to teach that God's Son only came to save a select few, but that's not at all the case. The Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, H-A-V-E, have everlasting life. Notice for the grace of God in uh, chapter 2 verse 11, God is reaching down in grace to you. He's reaching down in grace to you uh, to, to give you and I something that we did not deserve. He wants to give us salvation. If he had given us what we deserve, we'd be forever in hell with the devil and his angels. We deserved wrath. We deserved judgment. But that wrath, that judgment, was taken out on our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And we sing, that's in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 and 6. We sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Jesus paid in full the punishment that our sin deserved. There's nothing left for you to do. Nothing left for you to do except to believe. Put all of your faith, all of your trust, all of your confidence in him. Your church can't save you. Your parents can't save you. Your religion can't save you. And you can't, you can't save yourself. You can't, it's absolutely useless to even try to save yourself. But Jesus can. And he's standing at the door of your heart with his arms wide open. And he's saying, come unto me, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Secondly, God's free gift of salvation demands a change. It demands a change in a person's heart and life. Verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You know, once a sinner is saved, he doesn't keep on living the way that he did before the Lord saved him. And really, if he's really saved, he doesn't want to. A change has taken place within. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation, a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The saved sinner has come under a new ownership. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us of God. Now, as those waiting for our Savior were to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts in our hearts and our lives, were to say no. 
Say no to former cravings and lusts that were ungodly, not Christ-like. Now we're separated from the world and we're separated unto Christ. Now we live soberly. That's living a life that exercises self-control. We're to live righteously, lives that are characterized by right living. My father-in-law asked me one time about my brother-in-law, John, uh, uh, one time, Mary's husband, and he said, uh, John, still going to that little church you go to? I said, yes. My father-in-law said, thought there was something strange about him. <laughs> well, it's true. Uh, uh, John had trusted Jesus. Now he was saved. Jesus makes a difference. He makes a difference in the heart and the life. Others can see that difference. And there are those who teach today that it doesn't matter how you live once you're saved. Uh, uh, don't, don't want anyone to think that you've become a fanatic or something like that, you know, but I think it's that's so funny because nobody can, could have been more fanatical than I was before the Lord saved me. I remember a, a man, George Jakes, he's gone home with the Lord now, uh, but you know, they thought they committed him to the Nova Scotia hospital. They actually did. They put him in, I think they wanted to throw away the key because he was acting so oddly once he put his faith and his trust in the Lord. But they proved him to be perfectly sane. He was probably saner than the people that wanted to put him in. But you know, there's a change that taken place in his heart and in his life. All he wanted to do was to talk about Jesus, you know? Just about every sentence that came out of his mouth had something to do with Jesus in it. He'd quote his passage of scripture and then go on to another passage of scripture that related to that passage of scripture. Uh, Christ was his life and it ch changed him completely. And people thought that he was crazy because of that. But you know, it ought to be that way with every one of us. All we need to talk about, all we ought to talk about, we ought to be talking about Jesus and the wonderful things that he's done to us. We ought to be becoming more and more like our master. It does matter how we live after we're saved. It does matter what other people see us to be. Uh, we ought to be becoming more and more like the master every day. We're his ambassadors. We're his representatives here among men. We're to live godly lives in this present world. First John chapter three, verses one to three. I love those verses. It says, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we, imagine we, should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. That's what we are. Now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then the next verse says, And every man that hath his hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. You know, we live in a day when people want to look like the rest of the world. Oh my, they don't want us to, we don't, we don't want to stand out, you know. But we should stand out. There's nothing, who wants to look like the rest of the world when the rest of the world is lost and, and, and it's on its way to hell? We should, we should be different. I've seen preachers on the street sometimes, oh, when we were giving out tracts, I remember this one man, he came along, he was a preacher, I know he was a preacher, but he looked the same as everybody else. I don't think he should look like the rest, like everybody else. He shouldn't blend in. He should stand out. He should be different. We should be different. We should be dressed differently. We should walk differently. We should talk differently. Everything about us ought to be different. And if it makes you look like a little bit of a fanatic, well, well, I suppose that the Lord Jesus Christ was a fanatic too. I don't know. But that's, we, we call this a purifying hope. And yes, God's free gift of salvation demands a change in our lives. And we're to be looking up. Titus 2, verse 13, it says, uh, we're, to, we're to be looking for that blessed hope. Our hope isn't from down beneath. No, it's from uh, coming from above. So we need to be looking up. Verse 13, looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're not going to find it by looking down. We're going to find it by looking up. When he came to that lowly manger in Bethlehem the first time, almost 2,000 years ago, you know the Lord Jesus Christ came in humility. In humility. He was born of the poorest, as the poorest of men. He was uh, the shadow of being an illeg of an illegit illegitimate birth that uh, was hanging over his head. Uh, very few actually knew who he was. And I hesitate to say some of these things, but who would believe that an unmarried woman could ever have a child without a human father? If somebody was to say that today, we'd say, you're crazy. That just literally cannot be. It, it can't happen. The stigma, the reproach Mary and Joseph must have borne. He must have borne a terrible reproach, really. It says in John chapter 1 and verse 11, he came unto his own and his own received him not. My. Isaiah 53, 3 says he, was he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And I don't think that that just applies to the cross. I think people looked down their nose at him all his life, thinking, Who's this upstart coming into the world? He doesn't even have a father. My, that's terrible. We know that the common people, the common people heard him gladly. The Bible says so. But the chief priests and the rulers hated the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not well received by those that he grew up with. They tried to throw him down over a cliff, but they couldn't because he was God and he just passed them by. We sing of the shame that he bore to purchase our redemption. I'm sure that it was far more than what we could ever imagine. One day we're going to see it all as it actually was. We're going to see it the way that it really was at that time. But that blessed hope speaks nothing of humility. Uh, that blessed hope speaks nothing of humility and shame. No, it speaks of his glorious appearing his glorious appearing, and of who he is. It's that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the one that's called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. My, he's not coming in any humility this next time. This is our Redeemer, that's coming in glory. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. How our heavenly bridegroom loves us. How he loves us. Who gave himself for us. He willingly humbled himself. He laid his back to the smiters. He allowed his tormentors to tear the beard off of his face. He allowed, his, uh, uh, he allowed sinful men to actually spit in his face. Can you imagine that? Spit in his face. Those Roman soldiers took those long, cruel nails and nailed them into his hands and into his feet, attaching him to that cross. Why? Why did he do that? He did that because he loves us. He did it because he loves us. There wouldn't have been any hope for you and I had he not been willing to do that because he loved us. He was taking our shame. He was bearing our punishment, bearing the punishment that we deserved to bear. His precious blood was shed for you. It was shed for me. It was shed for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, that he might buy us back out of the slave market of sin that he might break Satan's power over us. And when it was all done, that we might be purified, cleansed by his precious blood, that we might be a peculiar people. I think that might mean more than odd. You know, I often think of uh, being peculiar as being odd, but I think it means more than that. I think it means purchased, it means a purchased people, 
purchased with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the people now that are zealous of good works. John was speaking about that this morning in, uh, our, in, in our morning service. We're to be working while we're waiting. And I think that we don't have much more time to be working. I believe that the imminent, I believe in the imminent return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, that word imminent doesn't mean immediate. That word imminent means that he may appear at any moment. And we ought to have that in our minds all the time, that Jesus could appear at any moment and snatch us away and take us home to be with him. Now you have to be born again. Before that happens, you need to be saved. But that promise is made to us. You know, others have shared in this hope that the disciples did. In John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, and Jesus is speaking. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. They were worried because he was going to go back to heaven. They were, he was going to leave this earthly scene after he'd gone to the cross and all of these things. And they were concerned about it. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He didn't tell them right there that he's God, but believe also in me. And my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Each of these disciples <clears throat> suffered terribly for the Lord after he was taken back up into heaven. Uh, they suffered terribly for him, serving him, waiting for him to appear, waiting for these words to be fulfilled even in their lifetime. These words must have been more than a comfort for the present time when they were troubled because Jesus had told them that he was going away back to his father. But they must have gone over and over again in their minds and their hearts as they served him, as they suffered for him, as they labored for him proclaiming his precious gospel to a lost and a dying world. But praise God, but praise God, he, he didn't return in their lifetime. I'm glad he didn't return in their lifetime. This blessed hope wasn't only for their generation, it was for generations to come. And then the Apostle Paul shared in this hope, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 58. This is known as the resurrection chapter of the Bible. We find the gospel in miniature in the first few verses, and we'll read them just in case you don't know. I'm sure that you do. We'll read it anyway because we love to read God's word. But in verses 1 to 4, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That the, that's the gospel in miniature. That's the gospel in miniature. Have you received it? Have you received it? Are you standing in it? Is it all your confidence? Is all of your faith and trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ can't be added to and it can't be taken away from. You might say, oh, if I uh, ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, I've got to be baptized. Well, you should be baptized, but you don't got to be baptized because that would be adding to the salvation that he's already done. Uh, you might say, oh boy, now that I'm saved, I must become a, a member of the church. Well, you ought to be a member of a local church that believes the same as we do, believes the word of God, but you don't have to belong to a local church in order to be saved. Uh, you would be saved and then you join a local church because that's where uh, believers of like precious faith worship together and, and wait for the Lord together. But uh, being a church member isn't a part of the salvation transaction that you're you're going to be going through no it doesn't mean that but uh, 
but that's the gospel in miniature, and have you received it? Now look down to first, verses 51 to 58. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We're not all going to die and be laid in the grave. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which give us, us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Notice the rapidity of his appearing in verse 52. We're not all going to die, like I said. Many will be alive when he appears, but all of us are going to be changed. Every one of us are going to experience a change. It'll happen at the last trump. It's going to happen in a moment. It's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. You know, I, I've worked in the medical field for a long time, mostly in my life. And when you look at a living person, every living person, unless they're blind, mind you, <laughs> but every living person has a twinkle in their eye. And when I look at you, I can see a twinkle. When you look at me, you want to be able to see a twinkle. But when the last breath goes out of that human being, that twinkle disappears. The light of that eye is put out. But this twinkle is something that is there and you see it. And it happened when you see that it happened so fast, you didn't see it happen. You didn't see it happen. My mom was taken home in 1981 and a corruptible body was laid to rest. In a moment at the resurrection, in a moment, that corruptible body will be made inc incorruptible. I'm mortal. We're living. We're here right now. We're mortal. And uh, in a moment, uh, I and you, if you're a believer uh, this evening, will be made immortal. We're going to have a body that is fit for heaven. There's going to be a resurrection at the last trump. Those dead bodies will be changed. We mortals will never die. We too will be changed. Death is going to be swallowed up in victory. And that victory is because the Lord Jesus Christ loved us and went to the cross of Calvary and paid the price for our sin and rose again on the third day, never ever to see death again. Paul preached this truth. He taught this truth. He expected this truth to this truth to happen in his day. He expected it to happen in his day, uh, but it didn't. It didn't. Uh, but we, 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 weren't, we weren't born yet. Uh, we, we would have missed out if it had been taken back in his day. And then the third, the believers in Thessalonica uh, had this hope. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Uh, we use these verses in Often, maybe because of what's written in verse 18, because in verse 18 it says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The hope of Jesus coming does give hope. It gives hope. It gives comfort. This text gives hope to those bereaved at the graveside of a departed loved one. We know that death is but for a short time, only for a little while. And soon they're going to be reunited with, them, with their loved ones. Death is a, a, a terrible thing. It's a thief. It's a, it's a robber. 
I don't particularly enjoy growing old. It reminds me, and it reminds us, that death is coming, even for me. But you know, I'm a Christian. So when the devil causes me to think on that line, I remember Jesus' promise in John chapter 14. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We're not as others who have no hope. Pastor Rockwood used to say, I'm not waiting for the undertaker. I'm waiting for the upper taker. Well, I'm not waiting for the undertaker either. I'm waiting for the upper taker to come and take me home. The Thessalonian believers were concerned. They were a persecuted people, but that isn't what they were concerned about. Paul had taught them about the resurrection, but they were concerned over those of them who had already died. Was it too late for them? When Jesus comes, are, are they going to be forgotten? So Paul writes them this wonderful assurance. He says, but I would not have you to, be, in verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. God doesn't want his children to uh, be left in the dark. He doesn't want us to have doubts. We have a hope. This world has no hope as long as they reject Jesus. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Only those dead corruptible bodies are asleep. The, 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 the soul and the spirit, they're, they're in heaven right now. And they're going to come back, back and be reunited with that body, which is going to be made incorruptible. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We're not going to hold them back. We're not going to prevent them. We're not going to hold them back. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And aren't they such a word of comfort, really? Wars are taking place in Israel, taking place in the Ukraine. There's so much suffering, so much death, so much dying, so many broken hearts. But comfort one another with these words. Saints living in the early New Testament period greeted one another with Maranatha, the Lord is coming. That was the greeting that they used with one another. Well, his appearing is much nearer today than it was way back then. And we're seeing signs of his coming. So we close this message with Maranatha, the Lord is coming. Father in heaven, we thank thee for the sure promise from the word of God that we have a savior who not only came into this world to suffer and bleed and die for us and pay the price for our sin, to shed his precious blood in atonement for our sin, but he's promised to come again and take us home to be in heaven with him. Father, help us to grab hold, hold on to this blessed hope. Help it to be a comfort and a, 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 a stronghold for us to flee to and to uh, rely upon right up until that day when Jesus does come. Father, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but Father, I believe that it's close. And Father, we're just looking forward to that day when Jesus comes in the cloud of heaven and gives that great show, come up hither, and we'll be home with him in glory. Oh, Father, we ask that you'll bless anyone here tonight that is there, could there possibly be even one person here tonight who doesn't know Jesus as their own personal Lord and Savior? Is there even one? If there's only one, and you're willing to put up your hand, we've all had to do that at some time or another, to respond to the gospel and say, Oh, I know that I'm lost. I know that I'm not saved. And right now, I know that Jesus died for me. 
I know that his blood was shed for me, and right now I want to receive him as my own personal Lord and Savior. If you're here in that kind of a condition tonight, I'd love to show you from the Word of God how you can be born again, how you can be saved tonight. Father, we thank you for the blessing that you've given to us, the liberty that you've given to us. I pray that you'll bless us in the closing hymn. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>